Well, hello everyone and welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. I'm Kathy Savoy and you will also be hearing from my two colleagues, Lisa Fishman and Lori Bowen, who is in the demonstration kitchen today. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. These webinars that are designed to correspond with what's growing in your garden and what's for sale from local farmers markets. With the growing season well underway here in Maine, we've got your answers for how to preserve these foods safely. Our webinars provide guidance according to the current USDA recommendations for preserving foods at home. The mission of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, home horticulture, 4-H youth development, food preservation, including our master food preserver program, food safety, and nutrition. We have adapted our programming as best we can to reach you during COVID-19 and hope that you are enjoying our webinar format. Today, we're gonna to focus on two favorite August foods. We will be focusing on how to freeze these foods specifically. Tomatoes and corn are at the peak of their season. We'll also share many great ways for you to use these foods throughout the year to make sure you use up all these great foods that are in your freezer. First, let's discuss some housekeeping. We've got the webinar set up so that you can hear us and you can see us, but rest assured that we can't see you or hear you. But we will have time for your questions throughout our presentation. We'd like to ask you to use the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and type any of your questions in that box. Thanks for joining us for today's topic of freezing corn and tomatoes, and let's get started. So let's begin with the basics of preserving and preparing fresh vegetables at home. That involves washing your produce. Over the past few months, we've definitely heard from many people who are concerned about the proper way to wash fruits and vegetables due to the coronavirus. So we are here to reassure you, there has been no evidence to suggest that anyone has gotten sick with COVID-19 through food or food packaging. Good hygiene for preparing food includes proper hand washing and rinsing produce thoroughly just before you're going to prepare it. Simply use cool running water to rinse your produce and this will remove most harmful bacteria. A vegetable brush can also be used for thick skinned fruits and vegetables like melons and winter squash to help remove any microbes before you cut into the produce. Please don't ever use detergents, that includes dish detergent, or sanitizing solution on your food. These products are not meant for human consumption and they can cause an upset stomach and GI issues if they are not washed off properly. We will include our resource guide of food safety information for consumers during COVID-19 in the follow-up to today's webinar. But the big takeaway is to wash all produce in just cool running water, and that's just before you're going to use it. So now let's move on to Lisa, who's going to introduce how to freeze tomatoes. Lisa? Thanks, Kathy. Tomatoes are abundant right now in Maine at this time of year, and freezing is one of the very easiest ways that you can put up your tomatoes for later on. You'll enjoy those on those nippy autumn days or those really cold winter nights. While canning has its advantages, sometimes you just want to head out to the beach rather than stand over a hot stove on a hot August day. And that's where freezing tomatoes comes in, and it is so easy. When you're selecting tomatoes for freezing, 
any type of tomatoes will do, whether they're the big fat slicers dripping with juice, the elongated pear-shaped paste tomatoes, or even the colorful orbs of cherry tomatoes. But the preferred variety for freezing for many home preservers is the paste type, also known as Roma tomatoes. These tomatoes have more meaty flesh than their larger, juicier counterparts. They have smaller seed cavities and smaller seeds overall, making for a more pleasing final product. Tomatoes do not need to be blanched before freezing. Yay! We do recommend you hull the tomato or remove the stem end before freezing so that that is ready to eat when you're ready to freeze them. The following short video demonstration will show you just how simple it is to freeze whole tomatoes. Hello, I'm Kathy Savoy, Extension Educator with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Today we're going to talk about tomatoes. We've had a wonderful growing season here in Maine, and it's time to preserve those tomatoes for use later on. When the garden's overflowing with lots of those great Maine tomatoes, remember, it is possible to quickly freeze raw tomatoes without blanching them first. Step one, wash your tomatoes. Step two, hull your tomatoes. Label and date a freezer bag. Go ahead and stack those tomatoes right into a freezer grade container. Leave room for the expansion that occurs during freezing. Remove as much air as possible from the bag and close that top. Place prepared tomatoes in the freezer set at zero degrees and use within eight to 12 months. Frozen tomatoes are great to have on hand in the off season for use in soups, stews, chilies, and casseroles. The latest recommendations for home canning of tomato products includes acidification. Acidification ensures safe acidity levels in whole, crushed, or juiced tomatoes. Simply add two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice or a half a teaspoon of citric acid per quart of tomatoes. For pints, that's reduced to one tablespoon of bottled lemon juice or a quarter teaspoon of citric acid. Sugar to taste may be added to offset the acid taste. For a step-by-step -step guide on how to preserve your home tomatoes, refer to the Let's Preserve Tomato fact sheet available through the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. See, I told you it was super easy. You can also cut your tomatoes into pieces to freeze them. You could cut them in half or you could dice them. You could cook the tomatoes down into a sauce and freeze that sauce in rigid freezer grade containers. It's really as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. Sometimes it's nice though just to be able to throw the whole tomatoes into the freezer and be done with them. So are you ready for a poll? Let's have a poll. We would like to know, how should you properly wash your tomatoes? With sanitizing solution, which is a bleach and water solution, with hot water, shouldn't wash them at all, with a commercial produce spray, with ditch detergent, or with cool running water. We've got about five more seconds to get your vote in to be counted. This is practice for November. Get your voting in. Excellent, okay. And you're also smart. You all said with cool running water is the best way. So we wanna stay clear of the sanitizing solution. Uh-uh, we don't wanna run our produce under hot water. That's just gonna wilt it and make it not very nice at all. We definitely do wanna wash it. We wanna get off those um, surface dirts and molds and whatnot. Um, we could use a commercial produce spray, but really, um, 
the best thing you can do is use cool running water. It's the most economical method and we don't want you using the dish detergent. No Dawn dish liquid on your produce. Uh-uh, no thanks. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, now we are going to remind you that we will have a couple of times during this presentation that we will answer your questions um, and we'll get back to them quickly. But for right now, we do need to pop over to Kathy who has some more information on corn. Thanks, Lisa. So yes, let's start to discuss freezing corn. It is, in fact, a little more work than freezing tomatoes, but no corn you buy at the store can compare to the flavor of the sweet local corn that you can freeze at home at its peak of ripeness. And I can certainly attest to this. Uh, corn does need to be blanched before being frozen. This does a number of things, including protecting the quality of the corn over time. If you were to skip this step and store your corn for more than a month in the freezer, enzymes acting inside the corn kernels will cause a very undesirable change in color, texture, and ultimately flavor. So blanching is in fact a very crucial step to ensuring a high quality final product. You'll need a blanching basket as shown in the slide. This will help to keep the process simpler by minimizing steps and also the risk of getting burnt. And Lori's gonna demonstrate how to use the blanching basket when we join her in the demonstration kitchen. You also want to avoid overcooking your corn since we don't want to go to all the trouble and end up with a tough corn product or a really starchy product. Cooling the corn quickly in an ice bath after you have blanched it is really a key step in making sure that it doesn't continue to cook and develop those starch flavors once it comes out of the blanching pot. So you want to chill your corn in an ice bath before you cut the kernels off of the cob. And this will stop the cooking and allow the corn to also freeze faster once it is in the freezer and a, a fast freeze will result in much smaller ice crystals inside the cells of the corn and therefore a higher quality finished product. So we've talked quite a bit about how to freeze corn and how to maximize that flavor. Now we're gonna join Lori in the demonstration kitchen and she's gonna show us the process of freezing corn, including that all important step that I've emphasized the cooling of corn. So we're going to join Laurie in the kitchen. Thanks, Kathy. I can certainly vouch for not overcooking your corn. Uh, last year, I overcooked my corn and it was terrible. I ended up giving it to my chickens this summer as a frozen treat. Uh, they really liked it, but I thought it tasted awful because it was so starchy and yeah, not going to do that again. Um, I think my big mistake <clears throat> pardon me, was that I was trying to work with too big a batch. Um, you want to be able to work quickly, so it's best to work in small batches. So let's take a look at what we have um, for tools today. Um, let's see here. I have my blanching pot, my cutting board, knife. I have a kernel stripper and a lot of ice on hand. And speaking of hands, I have clean hands, <clears throat> a clean work surface, and I got all my tools together before I started. And it really is an important step to inspect your, your equipment before starting. When I was getting everything together, I saw that this blanching pot here, I don't think you can see it, but this blanching pot here has some rust in it. Um, it might show. Yeah, probably not. Um, I can't see my screen. Let me just see. There we go. Um, I don't know. This might uh, become a flower pot. Who knows? But we're not using that today. Luckily, I have another blanching pot ready to go here. I also have three ears of corn per gallon of water. And this will be blanched for three minutes. 
I've already prepared the corn. I have trimmed out any kernels that I don't like the looks of and then washed it with cool, clean water. And I didn't use any type of disinfectant or detergent. So let's get the corn into the pot and get that going. And I'm placing the corn into the blanching basket and I'm gonna slowly lower that into the pot. Um, you should test this beforehand. The last thing you want is the water level is going to rise and you don't want that boiling water to overflow. So let's get that started. And again, I'm using three ears of corn and one gallon of water. We're gonna blanch for three minutes. I'm gonna open the pot away from me, of course, as we always do. And slowly, because even though there are plenty of holes there, it still can't keep up with the volume of water that's rushing into the pot. Now, um, I'm very fortunate this stove has a power boil on it. So I'm not even losing my boil as I place these into the pot. But I'm not going to start my timer until this returns to a boil. Let that sit for just a second. There we go. I'm back now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start timing. Like I said, once that water comes back to a boil, it should be just a second for that to come back. Um, if it doesn't come back within a minute, then I probably have too much produce for the amount of water in the pot. So that's one way to tell your ratios and to keep an eye on. Timing, as we said, is very important because under blanching will actually stimulate that enzyme that we're trying to stop. And over blanching causes a loss of flavor and vitamins. And as I can attest to, makes it very starchy and doesn't taste very good. Now, um, in this middle pot, I just finished blanching this corn for three minutes. And I'm going to put that in my ice bath for ice bath for about three minutes to cool. Um, normally I would have this ice over at the sink, but I wanted you to be able to see it. And all my ice melted, so I'm actually gonna add some more ice. Just one second. <laughs> We're all familiar with our five pound bags of ice, but if you're looking to um, figure out like one pound for one pound of vegetables. This is what one pound of ice will look like. Just a little bit of a hiccup here. I'll demonstrate the blanching basket as soon as um, these others are done. Let's go ahead and get those in so they can be cooling off. As Kathy said, the cooling off is so important. Okay, and it'll probably take, like I said, about the, about the same amount of time as it took to blanch it. And so we'll set that in the ice bath. And while that corn is cooling, Let's talk about ice and freezing because it is so important. Um, cooling stops the cooking process and helps the corn to freeze faster. And this gives us a better product in the end. For ice, as I said, roughly one pound of ice for each pound of vegetable, but that's just a rough guidance, you know. Um, let's see, oh, let's talk about freezer space. So. We recommend you don't freeze more than two pounds of food per cubic foot of freezer capacity per day. And guess what? Our newly blanched corn is ready as well. So I'm gonna stop talking about freezers and we are going to remove our blanching pot. 
not. Now, again, I move, remove this um, cover away from me. Now, same as when we went in, we wanna remove this slowly. I just wanna make sure my camera so you can all see here. The last thing you wanna do is just pull this up really quickly and have all that boiling water come shooting out. The same as when we put it in, the water could have flooded over and we don't wanna get burned because this is extremely hot. So there we go. Now, again, we wanna make sure when we place our basket into our ice bath that we're not going to overflow our ice bath. in the way here and there yeah. all right so i'm going to set the timer again and make sure that that gets um cooling and then we'll go back and we'll finish up with freezer capacity um <clears throat> so we don't recommend that you freeze more than two pounds of food per cubic foot of freezer capacity per day but what does that really look like so this is kind of a blank, blank slate for you all. Uh, I do have some ice in here, but this is a pretty much standard refrigerator freezer. And that is 5.09 cubic feet. I'm just gonna round it off to five. So how do I know this? Well, um, what I did was I opened the door on the refrigerator and I got the manufacturer information and that gave me the cubic feet of the freezer. So to calculate that, I said, how many pounds per day could I freeze? If I took two pounds times five cubic feet, that would be roughly 10 pounds of food per day. Now this bag of corn that I did yesterday weighs one pound. That means I could do approximately 10 of these per day. It might help you with a little bit of a visual. Of course, the chest freezers, um, they have a lot larger capacity. We all know that, so um, it'll be a little different, but it's still super easy to calculate. So I think, yep, we are almost ready to cut our corn. So, um, so I pick up this corn, you're gonna notice a lot of water. We wanna make sure we get off as much water as we can. Um, we don't want a bunch of water in with our corn, um, creating big ice crystals. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, I wanna make sure I'm hitting all the highlights for you. Um, I'm gonna use a knife um, and I'm gonna cut about half their depth. I'm not gonna scrape the cob and whatever tool you like to use, whether it's a knife or you know, a handy kernel stripper, use what does the best job for you and what you're most comfortable with. There are all sorts of tools out there and I believe we all brought our gadgets for show and tell and that'll be fun. But um, again, what works best for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting this off. I just wanna check and make sure you all can, yep, you can all see. So it, it's about half. Again, I'm not going to scrape it in this instance. And sometimes, <clears throat> You do get a little closer than the half inch, but the end result is always worth it. It's just not your purpose to scrape and run the knife down the cog. All right. Oh, I'll do one more. I should demonstrate the stripper real quick as well. But here I have my freezer grade bag. Um, I've already labeled it 
and I only use freezer grade materials for freezing. I've already put today's date and what's in there, and I'm gonna pack the corn in. Now, of course, I'm gonna fill this bag up a lot more than this, but just for demonstration purposes, um, I'm gonna squeeze as much air out of there as I can, and I'm gonna make sure, whoops, can't see. I'm gonna squeeze as much air out as I can, and that will go in the freezer. Now, let's see here. Um, I didn't put as much in as I intend to, but I am always gonna leave two to three inches of headspace um, because the food is going to expand as it freezes. Now, in a minute, we're gonna go back to Lisa for your questions. So if you wanna go ahead and enter those into the Q&A box, you can go ahead. But first, we can all show our favorite gadgets for processing corn. Mine, as I said, is this kernel stripper. It looks very much like a mouse. Um, so Lisa, what is your favorite gadget? Well, last year I bought two new gadgets because I wasn't happy with any of the gadgets I had. Um, I do like to use a paring knife that tends to work okay, but I found a couple products online. And the first one was this little thing. And if you look inside, it's got a metal ring and this side of it has teeth. And I know it's impossible to see, well, maybe there you can see some of the teeth. And the idea is that you would take your ear of corn, slide this down over and plunge it down and you would strip the kernels off your corn. My problem was that if you look on the inside of this, it's a very rigid, um, inflexible metal ring and my corn is narrow at one end and wide on the other. So it kind of didn't go down. I didn't grow 500 ears of corn that were all identical in the uh, shape of my patch. So this was kind of a eh, fail. Looked cute, but it failed. But then we also found this handy thing, which looks a lot like a vegetable peeler, but you can see maybe not this top blade has teeth on it. And so when you pull that down like a vegetable peeler and you rake that down your cob of corn, this other little blade acts as a guide so it doesn't splatter all over the place. And as long as you maintain um, a distance from the cob just to get the milky part, um, then just the, excuse me, just to get the niblet part, um, then you're going to get a nice clean scrape. This tool works very well. If I wanted cream style corn, I'd go right up, you know, closer to the cob and then I could scrape, maybe that's what this other little blade is for, scraping down the back and getting the milky part out for a cream style corn. Um, but this gadget works great for me. This one was the fail, eh, whammies. So I have a gadget too that I'd like to share with everyone. Um, unlike Lisa's, which had a fixed um, ring in the middle, this gadget can open up wider and then narrower. So it does um, adapt to the um, size of the corn, narrow at the top and then wider at the base. But what you will see is that um, it may not be the perfect shape for your ear of corn. It may not get as narrow as needed at the top. And then as you expand it um, to the size that some of our corn may be this time of year, you do in fact lose some of those uh, touch points um, for the serrated edge. And you can see that it does have a nice serrated edge on one side. Um, so, you know, this it works once in a while for me, um, but when I'm taking the time to get a lot of corn in the freezer at once, um, I have found that for me, there's no better tool than just a regular old knife. Uh, this is something I can work with very comfortably and I feel like I can get um, a lot of the kernels off of the cob and I can work at a pace that's comfortable enough for me um, to, to, you know, make sure that I'm keeping those ears of corn moving through the three minutes of blanching, three minutes of cooling, and then getting the kernels off the cob. So that's it for me and my tools. I love gadgets. 
I think they're the greatest thing. So that's pretty much it for freezing corn. Um, so we're gonna go to Lisa uh, for your questions and um, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Super, thank you, Lori. We do have a couple questions. I do wanna point out that when Lori was cutting her corn off the cob, and as Kathy mentioned, her favorite tool to use is a good old knife. Do note that when Lori was demonstrating, the end of her corn cob was cut flat so that it rested nicely on the cutting board and wasn't slipping and sliding around when she was using that knife. And that's a great safety touch just to remember to cut the end of that corn off and you'll have a much more stable um, ear of corn to work on. So we do have a few questions and the first one is, why do some recipes call for using enamel pans for a recipe? And what is better, an enamel pan or a stainless steel pan? I'm happy to field that question, Lisa. Um, so basically, the question is getting at the issue of um, reactive cookware versus non-reactive cookware. So whenever you are working with an acidic food, such as tomatoes, apples, uh, vinegar, uh, like we use in a lot of our home preserving recipes, you really want to work with what's considered to be a non-reactive type of cookware. And that could include things like stainless steel, glass, um, or enamelware. Um, because what's happening is when you do have the acidic exposure from those types of foods to a reactive cookware, you have something happen on the chemical level that can result in um, a release of atoms with um, of metals that are going to give a real off flavor and sometimes an off color too to your product. So you wanna make sure and know that um, there is a difference between reactive and non-reactive cookware. And if you are working with acidic foods to avoid things that fall into the category of reactive, which include um, aluminum, copper, iron, and a non-stainless steel cookware. Thank you, Kathy. Sure. Um, the question that also came in is, why did Lori not cut the kernels closer to the cob than she did? Lori, you want to answer that one? Oh, Lori might be busy cleaning up her kitchen. <laughs> so I will answer that. So um, again, it comes back to what kind of product do you want? Do you want niblets? The Jolly Green Giant would love to sell you niblets. So do you want niblets? Then you would cut further away from the cord from the cob and not get that really milky part of the kernel. If you are looking for a cream style corn, you do want all of that milky goodness. So you would scrape your cob and get all of that liquid out of there. That from my own personal experience is a sticky, messy undertaking. Yeah, the, the cream style corn is great, but you are just a fingertip to elbow mess of starchy goo. <laughs> Um, our next question is, is it advisable to put the corn in a strainer after it has been cut off the cob to drain off the excess water? I would recommend that you, um, so you, you've cooled your corn, um, and then I would recommend that you try to get that um, whole cob of corn dry prior to scraping the kernels off. So that way you're going to reduce the amount of water that ultimately ends up in your product that's going in the freezer. And also maximizing the flavor of the corn. So that would be my recommendation is to um, try to get as much water off the, the whole cob before scraping. Okay. And we have a real quick one coming in now before we move on to freezing to, to we move on to the tomatoes and corn usage. Um, do you ever remove the skin? Oh, do you ever remove the skins from tomatoes before freezing? You, you certainly can. Um, and I think that the information that we're trying to get out to folks is how quick and easy it can be 
to get the bounty of tomatoes that you're either getting from your garden or maybe um, able to purchase in a bulk deal from a local farmer. Um, so you, you can, in fact, if you wish to, take the time to get the skins off the tomatoes before you freeze them. However, we've got an upcoming video that I, I hope you'll watch carefully to see how easy it is to get the skins off of the tomatoes after they've been frozen and before you're gonna use them in a recipe. Excellent. And we are going to um, hold any more questions for the time being. We will come back in a little bit to capture some more of those, but we're gonna head um, back to Kathy to tell us what to do with our freezer full of frozen corn and frozen tomatoes. Great, thank you, Lisa. So once you have in fact put the, the work into freezing your tomatoes and corn, it is so easy to forget about them in your everyday cooking. So we've got some tips for you to remember to use these frozen vegetables. Um, tomatoes are best used in a cooked dish since you will experience a lot of textural changes during freezing. It's not like you can take a frozen tomato and slice it up and use it in a salad. It is going to have a very different texture. So frozen tomatoes can, however, go right from the freezer into most of your dishes that you're going to cook. And just think of them as being used in place of any canned tomatoes. So you cook the tomatoes for a while and those peels will naturally start to come off in big strips as they warm up. They will break away from the tomato flesh. You can also peel a frozen tomato by running it under cool tap water. And again, you're gonna see how that um, is so easy to do in an upcoming video. And the skin will be easy to peel off from that frozen tomato. Oftentimes I get it to come off in one big clump. Um, another trick is to pull all of your frozen tomatoes from the freezer later in the year, let's say November, December timeframe when we want a good cooking project in the kitchen. Um, you'll cook those frozen tomatoes into a sauce and then you can can it in either the boiling water bath canner or a pressure canner, depending on the recipe that you're using. And know that we will be discussing everything you need to know about canning tomatoes, um, tomato products, and salsa in next week's webinar. So please tune in to learn more. There's a lot of details around the uh, safe do's and don'ts for home canning salsa, and we really wanna share those with you um, as you're getting ready to prepare um, your family's favorite salsa, because it has actually become um, America's favorite condiment. So let's jump ahead and look at one last use for frozen tomatoes. Uh, we're lucky again to have our FNEP colleagues have created a video recipe um, on how to use both frozen corn and frozen tomatoes to make a hel healthy chili recipe perfect for en enjoying during the cool weathers that's coming our way.
we want to thank our FNIP colleagues again for creating that wonderful video for us. It looks really delicious, and I'm thinking that sometime in January, a nice hot bowl of that chili will be uh, on my table. If you have been freezing food throughout the main growing season, you will have a good amount of frozen food in your freezer. And you live in Maine, and winter's coming. And we would be remiss if we did not touch on freezers and power outages and what to do if you have a freezer full of food and we have an extended power outage here in Maine. So these tips will help you uh, know what you should do if you lose power for an extended period of time. So keep in mind that a full freezer stays cooler longer than a half empty one. As you remove food from your freezer, consider freezing jugs of water to keep it more than half full. Should you lose power, these frozen jugs will help keep your foods colder longer and reduce the risk of spoilage. If you lose power for an extended period of time, don't open your fridge or freezer, and that will help the temperature maintain a cool level on the inside. Food in your freezer will stay frozen for a few days without power, unless you keep opening it up to check on the temperature. If your food has thawed, it can be refrozen as long as it still has ice crystals in it. If it's completely thawed though, you'll have to use the food right away or you'll have to discard it. It's possible to use either a water bath canner or a pressure canner to save some of the foods from your freezer, as long as they still have some ice crystals on it. Or if they're very, very cold to the touch. You may not get the end product you were desiring, um, but you will be able to save some of that food from the freezer. So rather than those nice thick steaks on the grill that you were dreaming of, you might have to settle for beef stew from a jar but that's okay, at least you'll have salvaged some of your food. Always remember that foods should never be in the temperature danger zone for more than two hours. So the temperature danger zone is that range of temperatures between 40 and 140 degrees. And you should know that the quality of your home frozen foods may suffer if they've been thawed and refrozen. If the worst case happens and you do lose a freezer full of food, know that some homeowners or renters insurance policies will cover the cost of your lost foods. This, this makes keeping a freezer inventory a really good idea for more than just knowing what foods you have on hands. That's right, uh, freezer inventory will help you actually use what you have worked so hard to put up. We encourage you to organize your freezer by types of food like fruit, vegetables, and meat, and then store those like foods together um, in plastic bins or larger bags. Keeping an inventory um, in a notebook or with a worksheet um, that includes what types of foods you have and how much of each. As you take something out, update the worksheet, and it helps to keep um, you organized in your freezer and um, be able to know how to conveniently and efficiently get things out of your freezer. You won't waste any time digging around in the freezer looking for that last bag of wild Maine blueberries you knew was in there somewhere. Our resources that we will provide you with today will include a printable freezer inventory that you can use, again, to help you maximize your freezer's contents this winter and spring. We've covered a lot of information today, um, so let's take some time to um, make sure we've got all of our questions answered. Lisa? Super. We have um, a question that popped up, and the question is going back to Lori's demonstration on the um, corn. Why don't you scrape the cob clean with the back of a knife? Isn't that where all the sweetness is? I would say that uh, you can do that, and usually it is the back of a knife that is recommended after you've cut down through the kernels on one side to flip the side of your knife over and use that more blunt side to scrape down. And that again would be if you want the more milky, 
cream style corn. If you are looking for just niblets, um, as many people do prefer just the niblets, then you would not do the scraping. And at this moment in time, we have no more questions. And it also looks like we're nearing the end of the time for our webinar today. So we're going to go through these last slides um, just so you can see what we have here. Um, a number of recommended resources will be coming your way in the follow up email. Um, and we also still have our preserving coach um, as well as our main farm directory. Um, and also want to talk to you a little bit about those topics that are coming up uh, as we enter into the end of August and the beginning of September. So you can see here what those topics are and rest assured all of this information will be shared in your follow up email and we just want to make sure and end on time and we'd like to say thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, Laurie in the demo kitchen, thanks for your great work. Lisa <laughs> in Aroostook County, thanks again for your Q&A and all the information. And we hope to see all of you next week, um, again, when we cover the topic of salsa and canning tomatoes. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Happy canning. Bye.